Now, Brenda Butterfield is the grandmother-in-law to this piece of shit that Sonia Massey, Sean Grayson, and she wrote this editorial. It, it was an incident that happened earlier that day, and I talked to two officers or whatever, and I believe that it's the same officer that my mother had to Information is starting to leak out in the cracks of this Sonia Massey story, huh? Information is starting to leak out in the cracks of this Sonia Massey story. The situation surrounding Sonia Massey's incident has become increasingly complex. Sonia's mother recently disclosed that the police were aware of her mental health condition, yet they opted to use aggressive force regardless. Adding to the gravity of the situation, her son made a startling revelation. The police officer responsible for her death was actually acquainted with her. This twist changes everything, suggesting the possibility of a setup. The connections don't stop there. Sonia was known to Sean's girlfriend, and Sean's employment was secured thanks to his girlfriend's father. Clearly, Isabel holds significant influence in this relationship. This raises the question, if Sonia angered Isabel, could Sean have taken drastic measures in response? Did Sean enter that home with a malevolent plan? Or were the police complicit in setting Sonia up? The police were fully informed. So we gonna stay, we gonna stay abreast of this, but this is just a theory. This is just a theory. We gonna, we gonna update y'all as it go, but it seemed fishy to me that she didn't have clothes on and something was going on outside her house. On the day Sonia called 911 to report an intruder, it wasn't her first contact with the authorities. In the days leading up to the tragic event, multiple emergency calls had been made from her residence. In one such call, Sonia's mother, Donna Massey, alerted the authorities to her daughter's mental health crisis, pleading with them not to harm her. Donna described how Sonia, in a state of distress, was on the streets yelling, driven by paranoid schizophrenia. Donna was acutely aware of the dangers her daughter faced which is why she specifically requested that no prejudiced officers be sent. In another call, an unidentified woman mentioned threats against her, followed by Sonia herself reporting an offense by a neighbor who had hit her with a brick. When a sheriff's deputy met Sonia at the hospital for medical treatment, she reiterated her story about the neighbor and mentioned breaking a window to escape. Sonia also informed the officer of her recent discharge from a mental health facility and recounted an earlier incident where a police officer tried to run her off the road. The situation was becoming increasingly alarming. Sonia's family has been relentless in their quest for truth, holding multiple press conferences. During a recent media appearance, Sonia's son, Malachi Hill Massey, revealed that on the day of the incident, another 911 call had been made, resulting in two officers arriving at their home. Malachi believes that Sean was present during this time as well. These revelations paint a troubling picture, suggesting a deeper conspiracy at play. As the investigation continues, the pressing question remains, did Sean have a sinister motive? And were the police complicit in a tragic setup? The search for answers persists. During a recent press conference, Sonia's son, Malachi Hill Massey, shared some startling information. He claimed that on the day of the incident, there was another 911 call, leading two officers to their home. Malachi suspects that Sean was among those officers. Only other thing, Malachi, you may want to tell him is, you think law enforcement oh, yeah. came there earlier that day? Okay, it was, it, it was an incident that happened earlier that day. And I talked to two officers or whatever, and I believe that it's the same officer that shot my mother. I talked to his partner first. Then the second officer, I, that's the one that, I think, the one that did that. I talked to them, and they told me that, because she was driving herself to the hospital or something, she wasn't even at the house when this was going to on, but she was driving herself to the hospital. They told me that they were going to go there to help her, and then this happens. This revelation has sent shockwaves through the internet. If Sean had been at the house before, it means he was aware of Sonia's mental health struggles, yet chose to act aggressively. This raises the critical question, was Sonia set up? It's worth noting that this isn't the first time this theory has surfaced. In an interview with CBS Morning, Sonia's father, James Wilburn, disclosed that he was initially told an intruder, not a police officer, 
was responsible for his daughter's death. You know, I, I'm, I'm hearing that you were told conflicting stories. What were you told, uh, the circumstances of this? Well, I was never told that it was a uh, deputy-involved shooting. We were under the impression that she was killed by the intruder or some other um, person from the street or something, and they just went in there and found her dead body. Mm -hmm. um, I did not find out that the deputies killed her until my brother asked for Sonia's address, and I gave it to him, mm -hmm. and he said, brother, this says deputies involved. And I'm like, what are you talking about? James also mentioned that Sonia had a premonition about the events that would unfold. Adding to the controversy, Sean had turned off his body cam during the interaction. It was only through his partner's body cam footage that the truth came to light. Heart-wrenching thing that we've ever seen in our lives, but if it were not for the body cam footage, we would not have known that this occurred. This raises suspicions about Sean's motives. Did he turn off the camera to hide his premeditated actions? Was this not a random act of violence as previously believed? One commenter noted that Sean called Sonia a crazy B-word, suggesting prior knowledge of her mental state. This connection becomes even more intriguing when considering Sean's fiance, Isabel Butterfield, who knew Sonia. Isabel and Sonia reportedly encountered each other at a mental health treatment center. Isabel was set to marry Sean, but given recent events, those plans are likely on hold. I started doing some digging and I realized y'all said that um, uh, Sonia had on a hospital bracelet. I looked up the closest place where she could have got medical care to her house, an eight minute drive away. And guess what we ended up at? Capital Community Health Center. Theories are emerging, with many believing Sonia had just left the health center before rushing home due to an altercation with Isabel. This detail is supported by the fact that Sonia was wearing a hospital bracelet when she died. Could it possibly be that the, the police actually, uh, the, especially Sean Grayson, who I'm talking about, actually caused the situation in the backyard and then they took the call, which is why she didn't even have a chance to get clothes on? Because if I heard something in the driveway, wouldn't you automatically get dressed? and at least try to be prepared just in case they try to come in the house. The suspicious nature of the situation is further highlighted by eyewitness accounts. One person remarked on Sean's aggressive determination to enter Sonia's house, noting how Sonia pleaded, don't hurt me, as soon as she opened the door. Another questioned why Sonia remained on the phone with 911 dispatch until Sean instructed her to hang up. These details paint a disturbing picture of the events leading to Sonia's death suggesting a potential conspiracy involving Sean, his fiance, and possibly the police. As the investigation unfolds, the pursuit of truth continues. Sonia Massey's tragic encounter took an even darker turn when she requested her Bible, a clear indication that she was aware harm was imminent. This has intensified public demand for a thorough investigation, particularly focusing on the average response time in the area compared to Sean Grayson's response time on the day of the incident. The potential premeditation behind these events raises further questions about whether Sean's partner was also involved. Sean Grayson's dubious past has only added to the mounting suspicion surrounding him. As his name hit the headlines, many began to dig into his background, uncovering a slew of troubling details. It turns out that Sean wasn't hired as a police officer purely on merit. His girlfriend's father's influence was a decisive factor. Records obtained through the Freedom of Information Act revealed that Sean's personnel files listed his girlfriend as his emergency contact and her father, Scott Butterfield, as his reference. Scott, a former sheriff's deputy who retired after 30 years of service in 2020, provided a glowing recommendation that seemingly secured Sean's job. Further investigation revealed that Mr. Butterfield had described Sean as a mellow, non-confrontational person with good communication skills, highly recommending him for employment. Sangamon County Sheriff Jack Campbell admitted that Sean's personnel file included references from people he trusted. However, this raises a critical question. Did everyone ignore the warning signs simply because Sean had a reference from someone credible? 
Sean's employment history is littered with red flags. Between 2020 and 2024, he worked at six different law enforcement agencies, including the Sangamon County Sheriff's Office. Alarmingly, he had two DUI convictions within a single year, one of which led to his premature discharge from the Army. Despite these serious issues, a psychological evaluation in May 2023 declared him fit to serve. However, the evaluation did note his tendency to act impulsively and recommended that he take high-stress management classes, classes he never attended. Sheriff Campbell's claim of being unaware of any issues at Sean's previous workplaces is contradicted by records that show Sean was investigated twice for misconduct at the Logan County Sheriff's Office. One supervisor's report specifically highlighted Sean's insubordination during a high-speed chase. We're at the end of Second Street. She's taking it out right. How are you pursuing? about to terminate. She's flying up 121 right now. Despite being ordered to terminate the chase, Grayson continued relentlessly. To evade detection, he turned off his sirens and lights, a decision that backfired when he crashed into a deer. Until he hit a deer. Well, I'll definitely be terminated because a buck just smacked the side of my driver's side door. Did you violate a direct order yes. from a supervisor about termination? Yes, I did. Grayson was Additionally, there's a damning report from his boss at the Auburn, Illinois Police Department dating back to 2022. This review, written by the Auburn chief for a Logan County representative, highlighted significant concerns about Grayson's performance. While struggling with report writing might be forgivable, the chief noted more severe issues. Grayson exhibited aggressive behavior and irresponsibly posted about an illegal substance arrest on social media. Yet, Sheriff Campbell seemingly ignored these red flags. Instead, he provided reporters with a skewed rationale for his oversight, suggesting that comments about Grayson needing more training were standard for deputies of his experience and that he was subsequently sent to a mandatory six-week academy. Campbell further justified that a DUI conviction does not disqualify a candidate and saw Grayson's questionable employment history not as a liability, but as evidence of his ambition to advance to larger, more structured departments. This stance is contradicted by Mark Ayers, a Sangamon County board member responsible for hiring deputies, who claimed he was never informed of Grayson's troubled past or the negative reports from previous employers, an omission that many find hard to believe. This raises serious concerns about the police hiring practices. I would never bring on someone that had that trouble pass with that record. There are indeed numerous questions surrounding Grayson. Why did everyone around him trust him so blindly? Why did his father-in-law back him so strongly? Are they partly to blame for his actions? The situation escalated further when Grayson's grandmother-in-law publicly defended him amidst the growing public outcry. She wrote an op-ed titled, Does Anyone Care About Sean Grayson's Family? Or What Horrifying Reality They Are Dealing With? Which incited even more anger. In her article, she addressed the protesters, questioning their motives since Sean was already in jail, charged, and awaiting trial. She urged them to stop protesting, criticizing their actions as unnecessary and disruptive. Her words sparked outrage as readers felt she missed the point entirely. The protests were not just about Sean's current incarceration, but about why he was on the police force in the first place, despite his troubling history. The public's frustration was rooted in systemic issues and the failures of those who enabled him, reflecting a broader call for accountability and justice in the wake of Sonia Massey's tragic death. The controversy surrounding Sean Grayson's actions goes beyond his individual culpability, highlighting a deeper systemic issue within the police force that urgently needs addressing. Even if Grayson is placed in handcuffs, it does not erase the tragic loss of life he caused. Nothing like a weak-ass bitch in their hypocrisy in their white privilege, like you could just tell somebody that's protesting to go home. See, we're not only protesting that your weak-ass grandson-in-law 
Sonia Massey. We're protesting the fact that why was his weak ass on a police force in the first place after having four years and six jobs under his belt, not to mention the two, the two DUI convictions. Uh, you, you knew about that, right? Yeah, you know about that. That's also part of this protest. He shouldn't have been there in the first place to kill an unarmed black woman. Grayson's grandmother-in-law, Butterfield, further inflamed public sentiment with her op-ed. She asked, does anyone care about Sean's family or what horrifying reality they are dealing with? What about his fiance? He was to marry in October. She is an innocent woman who also is unfairly being persecuted. Does anyone care about the destruction of her life? She is left to deal with an emotional death. She continued to emphasize the impact on Sean's future in-laws and grandparents, all of whom still support him and feel a profound sense of disbelief and shock. These comments were met with widespread outrage. Many questioned why Sean's family should be seen as the primary victims when Sonia Massey's family and friends are the ones enduring the real loss. The children of the mother whose life was taken are the ones facing the greatest tragedy. The suggestion that Sean's fiance is dealing with an emotional death was particularly infuriating to many. This weak ass bitch talks about horrifying realities you all have to bury Sean last Friday like Sonia Massey's family had to bury her? Did you all have to contend with the fact that you don't even have all of the circumstances and details surrounding why your weak ass grandson-in-law, since that's what you want to call him, even shot their loved one in the first place? You want to talk about horrific reality. The line that incensed the public the most was, we will always support Sean. Judge not, lest you be judged. No man or woman is without sin. There is a final judgment for all. Proud grandmother-to-be of Sean Grayson. Many found it abhorrent that she expressed pride in someone who had taken a life without just cause and that she invoked religious references, especially given the context of Sean drawing his weapon after Sonia invoked Jesus. We will always support Sean. And you can, because Sean is alive. See, a casket is supporting Sonia Massey right now. One person even wrote to the paper that published the op-ed, saying they should be ashamed of themselves. The public sentiment is overwhelmingly skeptical of the situation, with one commenter questioning, why did he turn his body cam off? Thank God the other cop had his on. Another noted, cop went there specifically for that. Sonia's fate was sealed that night before she even answered the front door, premeditated. The broader public reaction is one of suspicion and calls for thorough investigation. Many believe that the circumstances suggest a planned act, and they are not satisfied with merely putting Sean behind bars. There's a strong call for investigating everyone involved, including those who enabled or supported him. What do you think of the situation? Do you believe Sonia was set up? Is incarcerating Sean sufficient? Or should everyone around him be investigated? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below.